In section three, we're going to look specifically at elements and compounds and telling the difference between them. Our goals or objectives are to explain the difference between an element and a compound, distinguish between a pure substance and a mixture, and to identify the chemical symbols of elements and name elements when given their symbols. All matter in our world is composed of basic elements. They might be by themselves, such as in these gold rings, the helium balloons, or in the greenish-yellow gas in this container, this chlorine gas. They might be chemically combined with one another in compounds, such as in water, which is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen chemically bound together, and table salt, NaCl, sodium and chlorine. They may also be in physical combination, mixtures like we learned about in section two, such as jello or this chocolate chip cookie over here. Pure substances contain only one type of particle. They're going to have their own characteristic properties. There are two types of pure substances. They could be elements, such as gold, helium, oxygen, aluminum, and others. Or they might be compounds, such as water, table salt, sugar, which of these are pure substances shown in this diagram? When we look at diagram one, we see only one type of particle, single little circles. This, because we only see one type of particle, is not a mixture. It's also only single yellow circles indicating only one element that's present, and they're not joined together. So this is probably an element. Number two, we see two different shapes. We see little green squares connected with little red hexagons. But every single one there is a combination of the same two things. If they're the same two elements chemically combined, it's a compound. So number two is an example of a compound. It is also a pure substance, just like number one. It's just a compound example rather than an elemental example. Number three, when we look at it, I see individual hexagons, individual circles, and individual squares. This looks to me like nothing is chemically bound. It's all just jumbled together in a mixture. So number three is a mixture probably of three different elements from the looks of it. Number four, we've got to look carefully because I see some that are the red hexagons with a single green square. But then I also see two green squares separated by one hexagon and two red hexagons separated by one green square. So this is also a mixture, only this time it's a mixture of different compounds. So one and two are both examples of pure substances and three and four are examples of mixtures. An element is the simplest form of matter that has a unique set of properties. It cannot be separated further by physical or chemical changes. The smallest particle of an element is known as an atom, and that comes from the Greek word atomos, meaning uncuttable or indivisible, meaning it's not able to be further divided. And we see a picture here of individual atoms arranged in a very regular pattern. Atoms are so small that they cannot be seen, so how is it that I was able to get that image that we just looked at on the previous slide? Well, obviously, they didn't use a microscope, not a regular microscope, one using visible light, because visible light cannot give you an image of something that small. Images of them have been generated using scanning tunneling microscopes, such as the one that you see here. A computer creates an image from the data that's generated by the microscope, and you get to see then an image of what the surface scan looked like for that substance. Not all pure substances consist of individual atoms. That would be monatomic if they consist of individual atoms like we see in our demonstration circle. Some elements exist as two or more atoms joined together to form a molecule. We see that in this circle. Some examples of these diatomic molecules. Diatomic molecules are ones that have two atoms joined to form the molecule. Examples of diatomic molecules include things such as oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Sulfur is an element that exists as molecules containing eight sulfur atoms. If we look down on it from the top, it looks like the picture on the left. However, if we look at it from the side so you can see the three-dimensional structure, the way they're connected together, it kind of forms a crown that goes around in a circle. Compounds consist of different types of atoms joined together. As we see in this little circle view screen, we can see little water molecules moving across the viewer. 
Compounds can be made up of either molecules or formula units, depending upon what type of bond connects them. We'll discuss that more later once we start studying different types of bonds. Here's an example of water. It's a ball and stick model of water. And this on the right is an example of table salt, sodium chloride, shown in a crystalline view either expanded out so you can see the connections, the, the bonds that are formed, or shrunk down in to show just a close packing structure. Every element has its own unique set of characteristic properties that can be used to distinguish it from other elements. Elements may share some properties with another element, but not all of the properties will be the same. Iron, cobalt, and nickel all conduct electric current and conduct heat energy as well. However, Iron reacts slowly with oxygen in the air to form rust, while cobalt and nickel do not react with oxygen, so they share some properties but not others. Many elements took years to discover because they don't stay in their pure form for long. They're too reactive. They react with other elements near them to form compounds. Sir Humphrey Davy was a professor at England's Royal Institution, and he discovered the elements potassium and sodium. Davy built a battery made of voltaic cells and applied the electric current to potash and to caustic soda, which decomposed to form the elements potassium and sodium. He later used electrolysis to isolate the elements magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, boron, and silicon. How do we name the elements? Well, scientists use chemical symbols to represent the elements. Our modern names for elements are based on a system created by Johns Jacob Berzelius, a Swedish chemist. His symbols were based upon the Latin names of the elements. Most element symbols are either one capital letter, such as N, O, H, or F, or a capital letter followed by a lowercase letter, such as HE for helium, CL for chlorine, NA, and others. New elements are given a temporary three-letter name from the Latin word for its atomic number, such as ununoctium abbreviated UUO, which stands for element number 118. Some English names are similar to the Latin names, so the symbols appear to make sense, such as N standing for nitrogen or CA standing for calcium. However, some English names differ greatly from their Latin names, as can be seen here. The symbol NA looks nothing like sodium, until you understand that the Latin name for sodium is natrium. K for potassium doesn't make sense until you see its Latin name is callium and so on. So make sure you look through these because these are elements you're going to need to learn this year. And these are ones that are harder to learn because the symbol does not seem to match very well with the name that we currently use for it. Eponyms. What is an eponym? An eponym is anything that is named for a person. Many of your element names are eponyms because they were named for people, such as curium, copernicium, Einsteinium, Mendelevium, and even Seaborgium. There are others as well. Although many elements have been named for people, there's only one element that was named for a person while that person was still alive, and that is Seaborgium. Glenn T. Seaborg is the only person to have an element named after him while he was still living. Toponym, on the other hand, are things that are named after places. And there are a lot of elements that are named for places because those places were famous or those places were where those elements were originally discovered or things like that. Americium is named for America. Berkelium is named for Berkeley, where the University of California is located. Californium for the state of California. Europium, Francium, those are obvious. Thulium is believed to be named for Thule, which was a mythical island in the far north. And erbium, terbium, ytterbium, and yttrium are all four named for the same place, Yitterby, Sweden. Now, what is a compound actually? A compound is a pure substance that's composed of two or more elements chemically combined together that are in a fixed proportion. All of those parts of that definition are important. It could be in the form of molecules, such as in water, or as an ionic solid composed of formula units of the compound, like we see in the sodium chloride at the top of the screen. We're going to talk about this magnesium demo that will either be done the day before you watch this or the day after. Magnesium reacts with oxygen from the air to produce a new compound. In this reaction, magnesium, abbreviated Mg, and oxygen, abbreviated O2, chemically combine to form this white powdery compound in the end, known as magnesium oxide. Since compounds are composed of two or more elements in a fixed proportion, 
This needs to be indicated in their chemical formulas. Chemical formulas are things such as MgO or CO2. These formulas show which elements are present by using the element symbols and also show how much of each element is present in one unit of that substance. And that's done using subscripts that follow the element it's talking about, such as the 2 in CO2 tells you that there are two oxygen atoms for every one carbon. Table sugar is also known as sucrose. It's composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In every sample of sucrose, there are twice as many hydrogen particles as oxygen particles. That proportion is fixed and can be seen in this one ball and stick model of one molecule of sucrose. Ethanol is also composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as can be seen in its ball and stick model, which is much simpler. In every sample of ethanol, there are six times as many hydrogen particles as oxygen particles. Although these two things, sucrose and ethanol, are composed of the same elements, they have different proportions of these elements, and therefore they are different substances with their own unique properties. Each compound that exists has its own unique set of physical and chemical properties. Compounds can be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. Elements cannot. A chemical change is one that produces matter with a different composition than the original matter. So the properties have changed after a chemical change. Sodium chloride, commonly known as table salt, is a crystalline solid used to season or to preserve food. It is an edible substance. Table salt is a compound of the elements chlorine and sodium. Each of these have properties that are vastly different from those of table salt. Remember, table salt's edible. Let's look at what these other two are like. Chlorine is a greenish yellow gas that is used to kill harmful organisms. I wouldn't want to drink that. Sodium is so reactive with oxygen or with water that it must be stored under oil. Sodium vapor produces light in some street lamps. So let's see. Sodium chloride is edible. Sodium is a very reactive metal. You wouldn't want to put it in your mouth because it would get wet and react. You wouldn't want to have it in air because it would react and chlorine is a poisonous gas. These are three substances, one compound, and two elements that are vastly different from each other in their properties, yet the two elements, when they chemically combine, form that compound, sodium chloride, with properties that are not harmful to us. Some compounds react with acid, others don't. This fact is used by geologists working in the field to identify some minerals. Calcite, calcium carbonate, will react with dilute hydrochloric acid. Halite, also known as rock salt, will not react. As you can see from these two images, these substances are fairly clear crystalline substances. They are not the same substance, and a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid can tell the difference between the two, because one reacts with acid and the other does not. Water can be broken down using electrolysis. That's passing an electric current through it. You can see here that as a current is passed through it, at the anode, oxygen bubbles will form and collect on one side. At the cathode, in the other tube on the far right, you have hydrogen bubbles forming, and so it's collected at the top. Some compounds will break down into simpler compounds or elements under certain conditions. They're not as stable as other compounds. Why does hydrogen peroxide come in brown bottles? Well, peroxide reacts when exposed to light, as do many other chemicals, so it has to be stored in brown bottles if it's not going to break down into simpler substances in your medicine cabinet and be useless when you go to use it. The fizz, or carbonation, in pop is from an acid known as carbonic acid that's dissolved in the pop, and it breaks down into simpler compounds, carbon dioxide and water. So why does pop become flat and taste watered down when it's left open? Well, this acid that's dissolved in there, as it breaks back down, releases CO2 and water. So the CO2 comes out as the bubbles, and the water then is now there and watering down your pop. So you don't even have to add ice to your pop. Just let it sit out until all the carbonation's gone, and your pop will still taste watered down.